December in the Piazza From the day the Metropole opened its doors, the good people of Moscow had looked to the Piazza to set the tone of the season, for by five o'clock on the 1st of December, the room had already been festooned in anticipation of the new year. Evergreen garlands with bright red berries hung from the fountain. Strings of lights fell from the balconies, and revelers? From all across Moscow they came, such that by eight o'clock, when the orchestra struck up its first festive song, every table was spoken for. By nine, the waiters were dragging chairs in from the corridors so that latecomers could hang their arms over the shoulders of friends. And at the centre of every table, whether it was hosted by the high or the humble, was a serving of caviar, for it is the genius of this particular delicacy that it may be enjoyed by the ounce or the pound. As such, it was with a touch of disappointment that the Count entered the piazza on this winter solstice to find the room ungarlanded, the balustrades unstrung, an accordion player on the bandstand, and two-thirds of the tables empty. But then, as every child knows, the drumbeat of the season must sound from within, and there, at her usual table by the fountain, was Nina, with a dark green ribbon tied around the waist of her bright yellow dress. Merry Christmas, said the Count with a bow when he reached the table. Nina stood and curtsied. The joys of the season to you, sir. When they were seated with their napkins in their laps, Nina explained that as she would be meeting her father for dinner a little later, she had taken the liberty of ordering herself an hors d'oeuvre. Quite sensible, said the Count. At that moment, the bishop appeared, carrying a small tower of ice creams. The hors d'oeuvre? Oui, Nina replied. Having placed the dish before Nina with a priestly smile, the bishop turned and asked if the Count would like a menu, as if he didn't know it by heart. No, thank you, my good man. Just a glass of champagne and a spoon. Systematic in all matters of importance, Nina ate her ice cream one flavour at a time, moving from the lightest to the darkest in shade. Thus, having already dispatched her French vanilla, she was now moving on to a scoop of lemon, which perfectly matched her dress. So, said the Count, are you looking forward to your visit home? Yes, it would be nice to see everyone, said Nina. But when we return to Moscow in January, I shall be starting school. You don't seem very excited by the prospect. I fear it will be dreadfully dull, she admitted, and positively overrun with children. The Count nodded gravely to acknowledge the indisputable likelihood of children in the schoolhouse. Then, as he dipped his own spoon into the scoop of strawberry, he noted that he had enjoyed school very much. Everybody tells me that. I loved reading the Odyssey and the Aeneid, and I made some of the finest friends of my life. Yes, yes, she said with a roll of her eyes. Everybody tells me that too. Well, sometimes everybody tells you something because it is true. Sometimes. Nina clarified. Everybody tells you something because they are everybody. But why should one listen to everybody? Did everybody write the Odyssey? Did everybody write the Aeneid? She shook her head, then concluded definitively, The only difference between everybody and nobody is all the shoes. Perhaps the Count should have left it at that, but he hated the idea of his young friend beginning her Moscow school days with such a desolatory view. As she progressed through the dark purple scoop, presumably Blackberry, he considered how best to articulate the virtues of a formal education. While there are certainly some irksome aspects to school, he conceded after a moment, I think you will find to your eventual delight that the experience has broadened your horizons. Nina looked up. What do you mean by that? What do I mean by what? By broadened your horizons. The Count's assertion had seemed so axiomatic that he had not prepared an elaboration. 
so before responding, he signalled the bishop for another glass of champagne. For centuries, champagne has been used to launch marriages and ships. Most assume this is because the drink is so intrinsically celebratory. But in fact, it is used at the onset of these dangerous enterprises because it so capably boosts one's resolve. When the glass was placed on the table, the Count took a swig large enough to tickle his sinuses. <laughs>